All right. Well, it's so good to see you today, and I'm glad you're here. Thank you for taking some time to talk about educational marketing. Um, I think you have a lot of insights in the real world to offer here, so I think this is going to be very inform uh, informational. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Um, so let's go ahead, and we have our uh, Instruct helpers going to go through the slides. But Jen, do you want to give your a uh, quick introduction of who you are? Sure. Uh, so I describe myself as uh, a developer marketer, um, recovering learning and development manager. I have spent most of my career uh, between two employers, which I think is relatively uncommon these days. But uh, after graduating from the University of Oregon, I thought I wanted to be a diplomat. And uh, nobody, it turns out, wants a 22-year-old diplomat. And so I did not become a diplomat. Uh, but I did the next best thing. I went and worked for the U.S. Department of State uh, here domestically. And um, I ended up working my way into a training role where I spent about a decade teaching citizenship law, leadership and management skills. Um, great job, loved it, but I kind of got to a point where I really wanted to pivot into a more uh, dynamic industry. There's lots of uh, assumptions about what the government is like and uh, dynamic is often not one that's used to describe it. Uh, and so I was thinking, you know, what would be, what would be more exciting and tech was really the, the area that I kind of knew instantly I wanted to be in. And so I moved from uh, government to tech with F5, where I was a learning and development program manager over all the, the management skills, coaching, collaboration, all kinds of things like that. And again, I kind of hit a wall and I said, you know, this isn't hard anymore. I want to go do something hard. I want to do something that's closer to the customers closer to you know the the bottom line of the business and so I pivoted again into um, product marketing and so that's where I've spent the last few years uh, most recently with Nginx which is owned by F5 as the head of product marketing and um, the approach that I really take to marketing and product marketing is an education first approach based on all that experience that I have in classrooms uh, you know, anyone who's been a trainer knows like the second you teach somebody something, there's like this little glow and they get really excited. And so that's basically what I've taken into marketing. And so my customers are primarily developers, uh, solely B2B tech. That's how we know each other is I've used Instruct uh, as part of that uh, framework for our customers. And then I also work with um, like architects and security types. Excellent. Wow, that's amazing. We're gonna we're really gonna get some good tips today, I think. So um, let's just walk through a quick agenda. So the goal of today's call um, is we really want to understand the impact of educational marketing, right? And really understand what does that mean in terms of customer perception and loyalty, right? That it's the end customer is the focus, um, and how does that work for highly technical products? And then also, I think the thing that you can share so effectively is like, you know, strategies, like how do you distribute this? How do you promote this content? You know, that's an important part of product marketing, as well as um, the business side of that, right? The How do we de demonstrate the impact, that glowing moment? How does that translate into ROI and how the business thinks about the programs? And then, of course, I think you have a really great example to share in terms of innovation. So looking forward to this. And I think we dive in. Yeah, um, let's do it. Yeah. So just to take a quick step, uh, my name is TJ Randall. I'm the Chief Customer Success Officer here at Instruct. And our goal in life um, is hands-on learning, right? We provide virtual IT labs in a secure version sandbox environment that's presented in a browser. So it's great. There's nothing to install. You can really get your users engaged quickly with your solutions. And that hands-on experience really is about showcasing your value proposition. And Jen, I know you're going to be speaking to that in some of your tips. Developers love it because not only are they, re you know, they're not, they're learning, right? It's experiential. They're getting hands-on. And it also, I think, allows our content creators to focus on building content. Because again, that's a real challenge. There's like, how do you engage with like viable content? And the, and the good thing about Instruct, I love, um, you know, we do this at scale. So we have a lot of large organizations that are doing this in very complex, large environments. So that's uh, that's who Instruct is. So to get started, Jen, help me understand. Let's start with, um, I think, first and foremost, what's the difference between thought leadership and educational marketing? So as we think about this and we get into tip number one, like what's the difference there we should be thinking about? Yeah, I think um, a good way to visualize this is thought leadership is one of the tools 
one of the options and an educational marketing strategy. Mm. So an educational marketing strategy perhaps starts with some thought leadership and then, you know, think of it as like a funnel, you know, you're moving down into things that are more like uh, instruct eventually where you're getting hands-on with the technology. And so I think while you can choose a single modality for an educational marketing program, you know, it kind of depends on your outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, Think of it as one of them as opposed to the only one. Mm, That's a great way to frame it. So let's dive into some actual examples then. So we listed out these as tips, which I think uh, you have some really great insights. Um, So go ahead. Let's take a look at the first tip that we're going to dive into, which is really about valuable learning, right? And so what are your thoughts here, Jen? Sure. Um, well, first, I I chose this picture of a couch. You know, tip one, give valuable learning for free-ish because uh, I am from Oregon and like on every corner, you'll see a free couch. Nobody wants the free couch. Nobody brings it home and like feels really good about that. And so you want to choose for your educational content something that's going to be of truly high value to your audience. Um, so, you know, going back to developers, they really like education that's going to either push their career further ahead or help them with a current problem. And so that's the value side of it. The free side of it is um, making it as frictionless as possible to access it. Now, free-ish being sometimes you gate that educational content. So gating for people who aren't in marketing means putting a a form in front of it that you have to register for, like this webinar. Um, And so you want to have like a mix of things that are truly free, which are more around um, building trust with the the target of that content. And then once they've kind of decided that your brand or your company is trustworthy, then they're going to be willing to give up their, their information, potentially get contacted by someone for a, a, a higher value item. Right, right. And I think that's the key word there is trust. Um, and it makes me think about what you said about thought leadership, like showcasing something like that as your kind of go-to-market and your strategy helps build that, right? You know, it brings a sense of credibility so that developer then can say, okay, this seems like something that's going to align to what I'm working on. Yeah, and you know, the, the exception that I'll give to this is sometimes you charge a nominal fee, $5, $10 for a meetup type of event. And that's because sometimes when something is truly free, people place a lower value on it than when there's a, a charge. And so that can, again, combine with something that's really high quality. The trust has been built. They know if I pay that $5, $10, I'm going to get something out of it. Um, that can be a good strategy as well. I think that's a great insight, right? It's tough to value free, but free-ish is definitely something that's super valuable. Yeah, definitely. Excellent. And I like the free couch analogy, by the way. So we have the same thing in the Boston area. All right. So as we move on, um, I think another area that we've really been talking about, and I know working with you is, um, we'll go ahead, go to the next slide, please, um, is thinking about the content education and meeting the people where they are. That's that's something that seems like that really resonates with you. Um, so what, what's your thoughts here? I think as someone with an educational background, it can be really tempting to go for the hard things that you know people need to learn. But with that, if you go for the hard things, you leave out a lot of people. And so, you know, tip number two, stick to one-on-one level topics is really about finding topics that are broadly applicable to the biggest part of your audience. Um, It makes it more accessible. It makes it more likely that um, they can enter at any level and then, you know, leave that 201, you know, if we're going with the school analogy, 301 graduate level, uh, that could be something that a training team or a, um, customer success team or certification team or something like that, they might address those more advanced areas. Mm -hmm. But when someone's newer to a technology, again, going back to that trust building exercise, uh, helping them get a really good foundation and helping as many people as possible is going to be, you know, again, if we're thinking about the funnel, you want that, that top to be big. 
Interesting. And do you find that by doing that, by having that 101 level approach, you get a, a better validation of the content back to the creators because they can hear that it's actually resonating across personas, for example? Absolutely. So I think you get two things by appealing to that um, that set of people who are earlier in their education. Mm-hmm. One is feedback on the, the right level itself. You know, if somebody is new and doesn't understand, uh, especially if it's a large group, you'll definitely hear that. Yeah. Uh, they're also um, less likely to uh, not get stuck on other similar 101 issues. So what I mean by that is if you haven't built your lab, let's use a lab as an example, mm-hmm. as simply and logically as possible, then you know someone who is more advanced, they can be like, oh, okay, I know what TJ meant by this. Yeah. But someone who's more um, novice will get stuck on those things. And so it can kind of f- give you feedback both on the structure as well as the content. Interesting. And we maybe we can dive into that later when you show your example. It's almost like as you're tracking the learners and their journey, what you would expect to see in that more advanced option, that person would probably complete it faster, maybe not to get as much validation because they're like, yeah, I got that because they want to get to that next piece. Exactly. And your instructions can be a little sketchier for those more advanced users. Right. Uh, whereas with the more uh, beginner users, you do have to be a lot more thorough with instructions. That's a good insight too, right? You talk to your audience, right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, all right. So another tip that I think um, that I know resonated with me here is like, there is a business side to this, right? There's the product. We are, we are talking about a product what, where have you found the most success in terms of uh, not making it a product pitch, but also talking about that product? I know I'm a product marketer and uh, this in itself sounds a little, little hypocritical maybe, but uh, especially with a B2B tech audience and especially with developers, an outright pitch often will um, have a very negative uh, response out of the audience. They'll be like, oh, gross. I showed up to learn X and you're just trying to sell me your dumb thing. And like, it doesn't even matter if your thing is good. They just get mad because that's not, uh, what their expectations were. And again, that's not where the trust level is that you built. And so the way that I balance this is by rather than, you know, we were talking in the the pre-show work about being in theater. Um, the product is not the star of the show in educational marketing. The product is the supporting cast. So the star of the show may be this um, industry topic. Let's use something that's really topical, WebAssembly. And so, you know, you're spending a lot of time talking about what is WebAssembly? Where is it applicable? That's the star of the show. But then when it comes time for the experiential learning, you're gonna have to have them practice on something, right? And so you may use your product that has a WebAssembly component in the lab or in a tutorial or in a demo, whatever the case may be of, okay, we're gonna show you how to apply these high level star of the show concepts using this tool that we're not here to sell. It's just the way that we're gonna show you how to use it. So if you're gonna do it that way, uh, making sure that access to that tool is totally frictionless, like you don't have to sign up for a trial or anything like that. Um, we have definitely run in, you know, speaking from experience, run into problems, asking people to sign up for trials. Uh, we don't do that with our products so much because the great thing again with instruct is you can build a lot of that in, but for example, if someone needs a third party account in order to do it, like a GitHub account, and they've never, you know, had a GitHub account now, granted for this audience, if they're not using GitHub already, they're probably not part of the audience, but you know just for sake of, of argument. Sure. Well, it makes me think of, again, to the personas in the 101 based. If I'm a development manager, I may not be as hands-on keyboard as my staff, but mm-hmm. the topic of WebAssembly, let's continue with that. It probably comes up in a couple different forms at that level, right? It's not just even about the tech. It's like, oh, it's really challenging because of X. And so the development manager needs to understand is like, how does your, you know, this, this thing I'm about to learn about your product suite help address that pain point that the developers are talking about and then the functionality. And to your point, I think that's the support that it would provide 
right? I get my context. I understand, oh, that's why this is so painful for my team. And then when I'm learning, it doesn't feel like a product pitch probably at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, going along with the personas concept, if you're targeting uh, a management layer of some kind, you know, they're both interested in the pain points, but also the business outcomes of the technology. I was just at WasmCon a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And everyone who came to the Nginx table wanted to know, like, what's the monetization strategy here? Like, everyone's looking to figure out how do you monetize WebAssembly? Right. And so, you know, going back to that thought leadership being a component, you know, you may start your educational marketing program with the landscape, so to speak. You know, what's the pain points? Um how is it being monetized? And then you trickle down to, okay, now you're going to experience those pain points. Here's your hands-on lab. Right, right. And then you can make that connection like, oh, okay, this is super important to my organization. Exactly. Excellent. Okay, I think we're making great progress here, Jen. I'm watching the clock because with Zoom, I know, I'm looking for we've got time. the hard stop. So I'm not, hopefully I'm not rushing you too much either. Um, but as we move forward uh, to the next topic, and I think this is actually a nice segue for what you were just kind of leading to is the the KPIs, right? The monetization, those types of concepts. Um, and of course, that's my favorite novel, The Catch-22. So I can't wait to hear the analysis there. But where have you seen that challenge most in terms of the KPIs and aligning to that? The, the KPIs are most challenging for me with other marketers. So if you think about how most marketing programs are structured, um, the, the way that your gold or KPI tends to be around revenue generating activities. So that could be marketing qualified leads, that could be meetings, that could be pipeline, you know, it's all kind of trickling toward, was there a sale? Or um, perhaps if you're post-sale, if you're looking at customer success, you might be looking at churn, you might be looking at retention, things like that. Um, the thing with an educational marketing program, because you're targeting a really wide pool of people, and because it's not a product pitch, it's less likely to generate those revenue related outcomes in the short term. And so that's where there can be some dissonance between a team that's creating this and a team that maybe is helping support it, or it could be the same team, right? right. Um, you know, them saying, well, I, I'm worried about giving you some resources because, you know, this doesn't look like it's going to generate leads and, you know, I'm gold on leads. And so where I think it's really important to start from is outcomes. What are we looking to accomplish here? Um, not only is educational marketing around uh, uh, trust, but it is around creating a large pool of leads ultimately who over time will get more and more qualified because they're being well-educated on topics relevant to your business. And so the long-term outcome can be better qualified leads going through a program like this, rather than, you know, if you've ever talked to a business development person who's a frontline sales, you know, ah, this person registered and they have no qualifications and they're never going to buy the product. You know, we want to avoid those outcomes, right? We want to be bringing in leads that are actually going to convert at some point. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, the examples that you walk through with educational marketing, one near and dear to my heart, obviously, on the customer success side is churn rates. And uh -huh. if you're not partnering in that way toward exactly what you said, that outcome based thinking, how else am I going to recognize how you are actually helping me in terms of my customer expansions as well as my customer health? And I think that's a really nice way to think about it. It's like a shared outcome all of a sudden makes things like data analysis and correlating um, concepts and then saying, what do I need on my side from a, a, a team perspective? That's a really nice way to kind of look at it. Yeah. And so short term, you're probably going to be setting goals that don't necessarily seem meaningful. Mm -hmm. So that might be registrations, that might be views, that might be, uh, you know, just plain old marketing leads that might not go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So definitely set those short term KPIs, because that's going to be what I call leading indicator that your program is working. Mm -hmm. You know, if you create this program and nobody engages with it, sure, the long term stuff's never going to happen. Right, right. But then you also set the long term goals. You know, what do I want to see in a year? Because these are often long games, you know, 
while I want to, I'm going to use the football analogy because my ducks are up on the screen. You want to start each game strong. You know, you want to win each game, but ultimately where are they going toward? You know, they want to get into the bowl series, right? So what is that outcome that you're looking for at the end of the season? Yeah, I think that's great. Love outcomes. All right. So tip number five, um, and again, a great segue there. I think the, this ties into that, right? What is that almost like shorter? These are actually really good short-term kind of ways to think about what can I measure? Um, so what are your thoughts here in terms of awareness and engagement? Yeah, so I set these as two separate buckets mm -hmm. because I think measuring just one or the other is not necessarily going to drive the results that we want. So what is awareness? Awareness is looking at is your customer base, is your pool of people aware of your content? So whatever your program is and your company. And so this can look like social media engagement, email opens, registrations. You know, again, we were talking pre-show about the number of people who register versus the number of people who end up actually attending or watching on demand. So those are all showing some degree of awareness and intent. On the back half of it, Engagement, that's did your customer base, your ideal target audience, did they actually engage with your program? So webinar attendance would be that great before and after example, uh, but also comments and questions. You know, did the audience engage throughout a webinar or did they leave comments or questions on a YouTube video and then going to instruct, you know, how many people completed it? We look at how many people started it, how many people completed it. That can also be a great measure of, is the, the content the right content? When you see a lot of starts and not a lot of finishes, that generally tells you you made a mistake somewhere in there. Another thing I've heard in that same area is one thing that people will track is the number of attempts a learner took. So they almost would accept like a lower completion rate if they saw the learner was really working on it but couldn't solve it. That might actually help drive a great engagement conversation you know, if I reach out, hey, Jen, I know she were taking that track. And is there anything that resonated there? They were actively learning. That's great engagement as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So we see two examples of that. One is they like to take it over and over again because they want to get as much as they can out of it. Sure. And the other is um, they may actually be having trouble. And so the program that I ran last March, we had a Slack component so we could talk. Yeah. And you know, some people had trouble getting the labs to work and they would reach out to us on Slack and I'd see, gosh, you tried this five times in a row and it didn't work. I'm going to go ahead and change your, your ceiling on how many completions you can do. Cause I can tell you want to do this, but right. it's also telling me like, gosh, you went out of your way to, you know, reach out to me for troubleshooting. That shows great intent. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go and take a look at a real world example of something that you've done. And what would, what, what about this are you most proud of? Yeah, this is part of a program called Microservices March, which is an annual program. I've been running at Nginx for the last three years. And the whole purpose behind Microservices March is to help our broader community better understand the microservices, uh, both industry, you know, what's out there, what's it for, as well as getting hands on with it. Mm -hmm. And then what Nginx then can do to help. And so what we did with this program is it had three components for each kind of topic. It had a live YouTube streamed webinar with, you know, high level, um, what we talked about, setting the stage, helping people understand. It included a demo. And then we took that demo and we did two things with it. We made a blog tutorial so that people who wanted to immediately jump into their own environment and try it, they could do that. And so that's more for those people who are at a higher level. But then for the people who wanted that more, um, we'll say safe experience, hard to break experience, we had Instruct Labs. And so on the screen, we have an example of uh, one of our labs that I recorded on reducing Kubernetes latency with auto scaling. So they could come in and they could try the lab and uh, you know, figure out the, the basics. And then again, they could go back and they could take that lab guide and do it on their own. And so what am I proud with it? Um, the amount of learning that I encountered in the community was really just fun and impressive. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to quantify it, but there was so much engagement, both in the, the live streams, as well as the labs that I could really see that people were digging the content 
and that we just completely stuck it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And it sounds like the, uh, you, you almost had like had an engagement pattern that you were working on to make sure that you were kind of like what we were just talking about your last tip. And then hearing that feedback also is what better way to understand, like you, you were definitely hitting the mark in terms of what you were trying to present. Like you were definitely in line. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we still have people occasionally bringing up this program, which this particular example is from 2022. So that it's still out there and living on the internet, I think is is an accomplishment, especially given the the depth of stuff that's out there. You definitely hit the hit the mark in terms of engagement, right? Yeah. Awesome. All right. So just looking at time, we have um, time for one question uh, that came up here. And it was what researcher feedback mechanisms do you recommend to continuously align the educational content um, with the evolving needs and preferences of prospects? So as, as your product's changing, as the market's changing, what, what are you using in terms of research or feedback? Yeah, I think there's no substitute for talking directly to the either call them customers, call them community, you know, however you look at it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I use two to three ways of making sure that I'm continuously hearing what their problems are and what's working. So one is webinars. I love webinars. The Q&A tells me a tremendous amount about where people's knowledge is and what their gaps are. Um, we do technical advisory committees where we'll bring in a small group of customers and talk to them about a specific topic. And that gives me a lot of information. And then joining calls with a single customer, whether that's in the pre-sales uh, cycle, you know, helping support sales or in the post-sale, you know, around the implementation and how happy they are. It gives me a ton of information, both about prospective customers and existing customers. And then you kind of just look for trends, right? It's a little bit qualitative, but yeah. it works. Excellent. So we have two other questions, but I think we are coming up to the stop. So I promise for the people that submitted those questions, we will answer that. And one of them, just as a sneak preview, Jen, is I think this is important is in organizations where marketing and customer education are distinct teams, how can we best facilitate a continuous feedback loop? I think that's a nice way to kind of summarize, you, you know, you've been talking a lot about the customer facing side of this, it would be nice to hear your insights on internally, how does this work? So I promise the folks here, we're going to get Jen to answer that question and we'll send that out as part of the follow-up for the webinar. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. Jen, thank you so much. I think this was super insightful and I appreciate all your insights. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.